it's wasteful and use those people better across the whole service. I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome, Minister, and thank you very much for keeping your promise and bringing the report here to this House. Uh, it is very much welcome, um, and it's very good for us to have a report with such an evidence base that perhaps we can move from an anecdotal discussion uh, to evidence-based discussion, um, and I do very much welcome that. And I, I, my understanding is that today is the first part of our discussion and that this discussion uh, will be ongoing because I would like to note that there are other Senators in my group who would like to speak, uh, such as Senator Spone is here. Uh, Minister, I know we're all too aware of the serious impacts that six successive budgets have had um, on, uh, with the social welfare cuts and the risks that it has to poverty, to deprivation, uh, or consistent poverty rates across the board, but in particular, obviously, child poverty. And time doesn't allow me today to, to, to go into detail on child poverty. Uh, my Colleague Senator Mooney talked on the silk figures, the latest EU, uh, the silk figures, 2009 to 2011. We've seen consistent child poverty rates uh, increase from 8.7% to 9.3%, and child deprivation rates have risen from 25% to 32%. Uh, the recent Children's Rights Alliance report card uh, gave the government an F grade for child poverty. It stated that there was retrograde steps in targeting children and families in the budget. We've seen the second budget in a row cut back to school including a footwear allowance, the fourth consecutive budget uh, to cut child benefit. And obviously child poverty is something we're all concerned about. I'm not uh, feeling that anybody uh, has ownership on the issue of child poverty. But I would like to note, uh, very often when we're talking about child benefit, there's a focus on the very early years of children, which is something uh, obviously I'm very supportive of. But we have also figures to show the intergenerational transmission. So when child poverty is there within the teenage years, that it goes on into adulthood. And we need to be very cognizant of when we're looking at child and family income supports, uh, that we look at all of the different spectrum of a child's uh, age. Minister, the, the Mangan report looked at six options uh, which came out mainly looking at taxation of child benefit in the two-tier system. I very much welcome uh, what you said today, uh, one, looking at outcomes for children, but also looking that you're going to look at the use of tax credits, um, and, and that's a further on discussion that we can have, uh, because I do think we need to address the stigma associated with the family income supplement. Uh, we've all agreed that employment is good, uh, but we do need to ensure that we have a system that encourages uh, people into the workplace as appropriate. Uh, I do also very much welcome in the report the universality um, of the, the, the unanimous agreement about universality and that there should be some form of universality in however we go forward. Minister, I do note, though, in the report, I was very surprised to see Appendix 3, which was the pre-budget progress report, which warned against doing across-the-board cuts uh, in November 2011. So that's two budgets ago, a clear warning. The group said, in particular, if the government were to decide to reduce child benefit rates, the group is of the view that any such reduction in the rates should ensure that there are sufficient resources available within the child income support budget for future implementation of integrated universal supplementary payment. And it went on to say that it considers the consequences of an uncompensated reduction in child benefit rates would be significant in terms of child poverty. And I think we've seen that uh, with the EU silk uh, figures, and we haven't seen how, how those figures will affect uh, child poverty you know, in the last year and a half. But Minister, I do really welcome what you said to us here today, and I listened very carefully, with your focus on outcomes for children, and looking back to say, well, what are, what are we about? Because I think we're all very well first, and we can go through the historic intention of the child benefit payments. But the fundamental question I think we need to add, and I think before we start coming down on whether it should be taxation, or, or whether we should be looking at means testing, is what is the function of child and family income supports? What are we looking for them to deliver as a policy intent for us? Um, is it to invest and contribute towards healthy, well-educated and secure childhoods, uh, which in turn is an investment in healthy, well-educated and secure adults who are less likely to be dependent on social welfare? I think we have some really tough decisions to make, Minister, but for me, certainly, I believe that child poverty can be best tackled by investment in services and not just investment in payments. Um, we need to ensure that there are wraparound services for a healthy uh, childhood, secure childhoods, um, and 
Look, Minister, there's no shortages of the services that would need to be invested in. Many uh, colleagues will mention aff affordable and accessible quality so childhood. One, one minute. No problem. Uh, second year of the early childhood education after school, universal health care, school books campaigns such as those advocated by Vincent Paul or the youth work sector. But, Minister, I just want to note, you mentioned about taking some of the savings and putting it into the Child Care Plus initiative, but only 11% of the savings from the budget went into the Child Care Plus initiative. That's what children benefited from. The other 89% went into the General Exchequer. It didn't benefit children. Last week, Minister, the European Commission recommendation on child poverty and well-being on investing in children breaking the cycle of disadvantage. It said it should be an integrated strategy based on a three-pillar approach. One, access to adequate resources. Two, access to affordable quality services and three, a child's right to participate. And I actually think they're the pillars we should be bringing forward in our discussion. When we're looking at how are we going to look at child and family income supports, we need to ensure that we have that three-pillar approach. I, Minister, I know we have tough decisions, but I suppose for me, the difficulty I still have, because I've listened to your speech, is what is the scope of our discussions? Because are we purely looking within the remit of the Department of Social Protection? Because then we get into means testing and taxing. And, and looking at tax credits. Or can we really look, as you have said to us today, to look at the outcomes for children, look at the delivery of services, look at redirecting, but we need to ensure that we don't take away the safety net. We need to ensure those services are in place before any further reductions are made. Well, here, like, and uh, Minister, thank you for coming in here today with this report, as you promised you would. However, as you said yourself, it needs extensive debate, so I'm very disappointed in the time allocated today for this debate. It's, it's just uh, an hour, and there's only 20 minutes left in that hour. 